I wonder if you can remember when you were ordained as a minister, elder or deacon. Perhaps you can remember the way the church looked that day, the pulpit, communion table or stained glass windows. Perhaps you can remember who was with you, whether the minister, the folk being ordained alongside you or close friends and family. Or perhaps it's the feeling that you remember, whether it was one of joy, anxiety, or just sheer panic. But one of the things you'll probably remember less is what you signed that day. Because at every ordination of the Church of Scotland, each office holder puts their signature to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, wait, what did I sign? Others among you may know the name of the confession, but may know little else about it. But others may know its contents intimately, with the confession forming an important part of your own faith. Well, following an instruction from the General Assembly of 2021, the Theological Forum has been tasked with producing a short video that gives a summary of what the Westminster Confession of Faith says. That will take up the majority of this video. But I'm also going to outline the reforms that the Forum is proposing to make in relation to the Confession, and invite you as a Kirk Session or Presbytery to give us your views about the future of the Westminster Confession in our church. The Westminster Confession of Faith was written in 1646 by a large group of divines or theologians in Westminster, London. The delegates were primarily from the Church of England, but a small number of representatives from the Church of Scotland too. It was written to try and bring religious unity to Britain at a time when there was a great deal of conflict, both religious and political. While it was adopted by the Church of England for only a brief spell, it has remained the principal subordinate standard of the Church of Scotland since 1647. The Westminster Confession of Faith, as its name suggests, is a document called a confession, not a private confession as would be offered by a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, nor a general confession of sin, which would take place near the beginning of the service in a Church of Scotland church, but a confession of faith, a verbal declaration of what those ministers at the Westminster Assembly believed about God, the church, and the reason that we were put on this earth. The confession consists of 33 chapters and provides a systematic overview of what its authors believe God had revealed through scripture. It touches upon many of the things that you would expect in a summary of the Christian faith. It teaches that scripture is the infallible and authoritative guide to God's will and contains all things necessary for salvation. It teaches that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and that God the Son took flesh in Jesus Christ and lived and died and rose again and ascended for us and for our salvation. It teaches us about eternal life and the eventual judgment of all people who will then either receive salvation or be consigned to physical torment in hell. Those are some of the elements in the confession that are shared with it and many other Christian confessions and creeds. But the confession also has a range of distinct doctrines and distinct approaches towards faith that mark it out from other creeds and confessions. The first is starting with scripture rather than God. The foundation for its account of doctrine is not who God is or what he has done in history, but the infallible record of his person and work in the Bible. A second reformed characteristic of the confession is an insistence on Christ as sole mediator between God and humanity and Christ's three abiding roles in the church as king, prophet, and priest. A third distinctive and one that is determinative of many others in the confession is that of divine sovereignty and providence. Everything that happens in the world is due to the will of God. 
with the confession teaching that from eternity, before the creation of the world, God did, and I quote, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. The confession also teaches that in relation to salvation and damnation, this foreordaining was structured through the use of covenants, types of binding relationship between God and humanity. The confession interprets history and many doctrines of the Christian faith through this filter that God made a covenant or agreement based on works or good deeds with Adam and a covenant of grace funded in Christ. Because we human beings cannot fulfill the covenant of works, we are all in a state of sin. And without God choosing to place us in this covenant of grace, we would surely perish. This covenant framework informs one of the confession's most famous passages, that on election and predestination. According to chapter 3 of the confession, God foreordained all who would be elect and therefore saved, while passing over those who would be damned. By God's eternal decree, some men and angels are predestined to everlasting life, while others are foreordained to everlasting death. The result of this is that Christ did not die for all on the cross, but only for the elect. While the writers of the Westminster Confession believed that their confession presented the timeless truths of Scripture, later generations had difficulty with some of the confession's contents. Some had difficulty with chapter 4's statement that the world was created in six literal days, something at odds with contemporary science. But others had difficulty with the confession's understanding of how Scripture came to be written. The majority, however, came to have serious reservations about the confession's perceived teaching on election and predestination. Their interpretation of the confession was that it taught that God creates some human beings, and perhaps the majority of human beings, only to send them to hell, and that no one can do anything to avoid their ultimate fate. For these reasons, in the later 19th century, the major Presbyterian churches, such as the Church of Scotland and the Free Church of Scotland, pass what are called declaratory acts, acts which declare a new relationship between the churches and the confession. After the passing of these declaratory acts, elders, ministers and other office holders were not required to believe every aspect of the confession, but only those matters that entered into the substance of the faith, the fundamental doctrines without which you can't be a Christian. This settlement has left lingering questions, however. For if office holders don't need to believe the majority of the confession's teaching, why are they required to sign it? If you office holders ever read or use the confession, is it fulfilling the function of a confession? And what are the fundamental doctrines of the faith? Can we have a healthy church where the fundamentals aren't properly defined or located? And can everyone's fundamentals be different? without causing confusion and conflict. Because office holders are still asked to sign the Westminster Confession to this very day, and because very few ministers and elders engage with it, use it, or agree with it, the General Assembly of 2018 asked the Theological Forum to review the place of the Confession within the life of our church. The Forum reported in May 2021 with the recommendation that the Church of Scotland should seek a new relationship with the Westminster Confession. Our preferred option, outlined more fully in our 2021 report, is to create a new book of confessions to guide office holders and express our faith. This book of confessions would contain the Westminster Confession, which would remain one of our subordinate standards but would also include other important documents that have long been used in the Church of Scotland, such as our first confession, the Scots Confession, 
published and written at the Reformation. In addition to being guided by a book of confessions, we are also proposing, however, that elders, ministers, and other office holders should declare their belief in the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. These fundamental doctrines are found in Article 1 of the Church's Articles Declaratory, part of our Constitution, and find fuller expression in the ancient creeds of the Church. The creeds are statements of faith shared by all Orthodox Christians. And with these fundamentals that we share with all other Christians, and with a book of confessions that reflects the varied ways of being a Reformed Church, we believe our proposals will bring three improvements to the Church of Scotland. First, by focusing more on the fundamentals that we all have in common, rather than on the issues that divide us, we believe that the reforms can help create unity within the Church of Scotland. Second, by focusing on what all Orthodox Christians believe, we believe our proposals may help missional cooperation with other Christian churches in Scotland. And lastly, we believe it will make a difference to you, that rather than office holders making vows and putting their signature to something they don't understand or even disagree with, these changes will allow a greater number of you to make your vows and subscribe with knowledge, integrity and confidence. So that's an overview of the Westminster Confession of Faith and what the Theological Forum is proposing in relation to it, with more of which you can read in our 2021 report, Westminster Confessions and the Church. But we want to hear your views about the proposals outlined in that report. And for that reason, we're inviting you to send in your responses to that report and your answers to the following questions. Thank you for taking the time to listen and to engage with these questions. May God bless you and our church as we seek his will together.